thank you, Jim, and let me join uh, my colleagues here from, from the Congress in expressing our appreciation for the ability to join with so many of you industry leaders. Uh, we've been able to work together in a bipartisan fashion, working for the issues that are important, uh, not just to the United States, but I would suggest to our region here as well. Uh, one of the factors that is often misunderstood when we're down in Washington is the real impact that the life sciences have here in our region, in my district, seven professional districts, one in five jobs is tied back to the life sciences industry. And as a result, when there are policies in Washington that have an impact on that industry, it has a disproportionate impact uh, here in our area. I want to focus on three points. And one of them, which I think is often misunderstood, is when you think about uh, bio and pharma and device companies, the implication is always these great big behemoths. The fact of the matter is, uh, when you are talking about, particularly the medical device companies, uh, which are the focus of the legislation to reduce that 2.3% uh, tax, many of them are smaller than 50 employees. We have over 600 medical device companies here in the state of Pennsylvania, 80% of them smaller than 50 employees. And as a result, when you have policy, impact small companies at the point in time when they're just beginning to develop their products, you're having a disproportionate impact on their ability not just to innovate, but to grow. And so it seems counterintuitive to me, particularly in addition with the fact that you talk about this 2.3% tax, which is in Eric and Jim's bill. But this is the point in time in which, regardless of the success of the company, so you may be talking to somebody that's beginning to make an they're beginning to make a breakthrough, but they're going to be paying that 2.3% tax, regardless of how successful they may be uh, in terms of the development of, of, of the product and, and having it on its market. So it's a counterintuitive policy uh, on that perspective alone. Uh, the second thing is, and it's been talked to multiple times, uh, is we are no longer engaged exclusively in some kind of regional competition. Uh, this is a circumstance in which we lead the world and continue to lead the world in innovation connected to the life sciences. But that's not automatic. And it's not something we're going to do year in and year out. And we're beginning to see tremendous competition, not just for these kinds of technologies, but for the ability to do this kind of research in India and China and other kinds of places. And it has been identified by, by Abbott and others that as many as 40 jobs could be at stake if we are to lose these and to send these over to foreign countries. We talked about the growth of that middle class in India and China. I do not want it to be at the expense of the middle class here in Pennsylvania. We have to keep those $50,000 a year jobs here, not in New Delhi. And the last and most significant point as well is we're talking about <coughs> innovation, but innovation is one of the keys to controlling health is the biggest challenge we're facing right now in Washington, D.C. is an explosion of health care costs driving the overall expansion of our federal budget. So the kinds of things that we could do to control those costs, and oftentimes it's the ability to address the chronic diseases like arthritis or diabetes or others with innovative solutions that will really drive down those costs. And that's why it's so vitally important we be supportive of this kind of innovation, supportive of the kinds of policies that allow these industries to grow and to prosper and compete. I'm looking forward to continuing this battle, this bipartisan battle, with our colleagues uh, in Washington to bring home the opportunity for us to compete here. We'll